The internet is a wonderful place full of things that can make you laugh, make you cry, make you feel inconsolable and uncontrollable rage to the point that you brandish a katana and obliterate your desk and give you a scare. It's a vast landscape of things both new and old and really old that can make a simple mind melt with knowledge. No matter how many years pass and how many changes occur to the internet, there are always three constants in your internet browsing life. Your first time on the internet, the first time you see something that's not safe for work, and creepypasta. Uh. What? Yes, that's right. No matter where you go on the internet or how far you venture away from the wikia forums, one thing that will always follow you to every comment section you go is a good creepy story. Good may or may not be an understatement, but some of the writings that surfaced from the depths of the internet's iceberg tended to be on the scary side. You've probably noticed that on my channel I tend to cover a lot of scary games and creepy TV shows and creepy guys, but to start off a new series themed around horror in general on my channel, we're going to cover things that audiences may find a little terrifying. But more on that at the end of the video. Judging by the subject matter and the fact that you clicked on this video knowing what you're getting into from the title and the thumbnail, we're going to investigate the impact, the origins and the fall of the Slenderman. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the mythos behind Slenderman, we need to look into exactly what the internet was like when he was created. The Slenderman is officially classified as a creepypasta, but what exactly is a creepypasta? In the many years that you've had access to the internet, I'm sure you've encountered a weird message that looks like a threat directed towards you or your loved ones, claiming that you should copy and paste this message to as many people as you can to spread the word or else there's going to be trouble. Nowadays you'd probably look at the message and chuck it right in the bin, laughing it off, but you don't have the benefit of hindsight and being older Ooh. in general, so of course you load all of your friends Skype histories with that message in particular, which would help to spread the word of the th thing that's out to get you. This thing could either be an urban legend or a scheme to get rich quick by sending this quick-witted Nigerian prince some dollar. This is not exclusive to the internet in general as chain letters have existed for centuries. Kaikelius would awaken from his slumber in the stone house and receive a scroll from Daedalus warning about Jeffrey the murderer and he'd have to spread the word by owl lest he get banished from the realm of the living the knave. I completely sidetracked. Anyways on the internet at least this act was commonly associated with creepypastas. Creepypastas are horror related images, stories and urban legends that are made by people on the internet with the intention of scaring readers, with stories tending to use the paranormal in order to keep readers from turning the lights off when they go to bed. Originally, like I said before, creepypastas were made with the intention of being spread across the internet. The term creepypasta comes from the words creepy and copypasta. Coined on 4chan in around 2006, a copypasta is a block of text which is copied and pasted across the internet. This term translated over to creepypastas where these posts would be short horror stories written anonymously and reposted endlessly. Basically like what Reddit and Twitter is nowadays, but back then the repost still felt fresh and creepy. The origins of creepypastas are still unknown to this day as the anonymous nature of these writings made it so that the history of the genre itself was difficult to study for budding writers looking to make it in the field. Among the earliest creepypastas were Ted the Caver for example, made in 2001 which started as a series of blog posts that ended up getting creepier and creepier as time went by. The earliest creepypastas were created and posted on the paranormal board on 4chan and in the late 2000s websites dedicated to creepypastas started to pop up such as creepypasta.com and the creepypasta wiki as well as r slash no sleep created between 2008 and 2010. In recent times the definition of creepypasta has shifted from poorly written anecdotes that you copy and paste to random people on the internet to poorly written anecdotes that are permanently archived on sites across the internet for people to eventually make a video on said story probably mocking it in the process. <laughs> It's also shifted from people writing stories anonymously to people making names for themselves in the creepypasta community and leading people to wait for new scary stories to tell in the middle of the day in broad daylight. So now you know the bare minimum about creepypastas, I'll probably make an entire video on them but I'm not promising anything, I think it's time to talk about how the slender man fits into all of this. The year is 2009. The world is officially scheduled to end 3 years from now. Someone's been playing a little too much Plague Inc and infected the entire cosmos with the swine flu and Blue Pocahontas from Outer Space is released in cinemas. You wake up, it's a hot summer's morning and you visit a website which goes by the name of Something Awful. Um, that's the name of the website, it's Something Awful. Can you stop doing that? Jeez. 
Anyway, something awful. <laughs> Shut the fuck up! Something awful, also known as SA, is a website that hosts a bunch of stuff like blogs and forums and the like. You look at that website and the subject matter just reeks of 2009. The funniest thing you ever saw on the internet at that time was that one rage comic about troll science mixed in with dreamscape trance music. On the site itself, there's a forum thread which details a Photoshop contest where users are challenged to create paranormal images. You scroll through the thread and you look at some of the images submitted. None of them look too scary, you can probably deal with them and then you encounter this it's a post by eric nodson on the pseudonym of victor surge it's a black and white photo of a group of children but there's something wrong with the image there seems to be another being in the image a tall thin figure wearing a black suit probably look at that and think that's possibly the most scuffed ad for hugo boss that you've ever seen in your life there's something different about this post as opposed to the other ones that are on the forum thread unlike the other submissions to the contest this post by Serge came with text. Oh, we love a good backstory. The text under the first photo stated that We didn't want to go. We didn't want to kill them. But it's a persistent silence. And outstretched arms horrified us and comforted us at the same time. Right then, this may be more than what it's cracked up to be. And then there's a second image as well, which also has this tall thin figure in said image. Under this photo, the quote states that Shown on the screen is one of two recovered photographs from the Sterling City Library blaze. It is notable for being taken the day which 14 children vanished and for what is referred to as the Slender Man. The deformities on film are cited as film defects by officials. A fire at the local library occurred one week later. The actual photograph was confiscated as evidence. And now the internet has something new on its hands to blow up out of proportion and make it seem like a much bigger deal than usual. This is just way too spicy to just leave alone in a thread like this to fade into irrelevancy and rot. So posters to the thread decided to expand on the character of the Slender Man, adding their own contributions to the thread, whether it be by text or by visual means. HP Lovecraft is cited as one of the main inspirations for the creation of the Slender Man, as well as the work of Zach Parsons, more specifically that insidious beast, also posted on something awful, which is an odd set of stories set in a world that's not quite our own. He also based the Slender Man on reports of Shadow People sightings and Mothman among other things. The main goal for the Slender Man as outlined by Surge was to make something whose motivations can barely be comprehended and also cause unease and terror in a general population. This plays into a primal fear a lot of people had when it comes down to it. There's no reasoning with said creature, it's literally evil for no reason. You spent 50 centuries on a sculpture you forgot to save? Well too bad, he just destroyed the whole thing and there's nothing you can do about it. Immediately after the creation of that thread, the Slender Man went viral. Everyone on the internet flocked to the mythos of Slender Man like moths to a flame. This is where the topic of creepypastas come back into the mix, as the legend of Slender became the basis of many a creepypasta and many a cosplay. After it eventually got separated from its original creator, the Slender Man became the main basis for several stories from multiple different authors that all covered an overarching mythos. From this, the internet starts to get a little feel as to what the Slender Man does and why he could be seen as extremely dangerous. First and foremost, the Slender Man is tall. In literature surrounding him, Slender is up to around 15 feet tall. If he was in your house, he'd have to squat down to even be seen as threatening. This is as opposed to in videos and video games where he's depicted as around NBA player height at around 6 to 7 feet tall. So at that height, if you saw him, you'd probably be able to spark him out. In terms of his appearance, he's commonly portrayed as having a completely blank face, devoid of all emotion and staring into your soul until you lose all grasp on reality. While people can probably laugh at this now, a completely blank face staring at you would probably be just a little bit unsettling, wouldn't it? As well as this, he also sports some very long arms, which would do extremely well in a basketball game. Come to think about it, he's the ideal NBA player. Long arms, very tall body, and blank expressionless face that would be great for all the cameras around the arena. Now, if you want to scare people, you have to make sure you're dressed for the occasion, and the Slender Man makes sure he is with a bespoke suit that can only fit him and his long arms, ensuring that he's well dressed for your funeral. From all of this, you may be wondering how or why he likes to torture people and why he's seen as very dangerous. Well, the why I can't answer, and I don't think anyone can no matter how many pieces of headcanon you create to try and justify your slendy fanfiction. The how I can most certainly answer though. In most if not every adaptation of Slender, the titular character is known to stalk its prey for days, weeks, months, years on end, until they eventually cave into their own sanity, unable to cope with the situation that they found themselves in while he watches from afar. Getting too close to the Slender Man is said to trigger what's known as Slender Sickness. 
Nights, which is a rapid onset of paranoia, nightmares and delusions that are also accompanied by nosebleeds. So Slender is pretty much your teacher calling you up to give a presentation about video games to your entire class. This wasn't always the case however, as the previous entries for what Slender's behaviour was like were much more extreme. Originally Slenderman was portrayed as being extremely dangerous, in that he would stalk his targets, impale them on trees and remove their organs. That was just a little bit too extreme, so his behaviour was tweaked and fixed as the passive aggressive programming he has today. One other important aspect of the Slenderman that has always stayed the same since his very beginnings was his ability to distort and cause major interference with audio and visual recording devices, which in turn would lead into one of the most iconic sounds associated with the Slenderman introduced in the games which I'll get into later. Back on the Something Awful thread, a post was made by a username called Cigars. This post was concerning a friend that he had in film school called Alex, who was having issues shooting his very first feature length project. While he was shooting the film, he was experiencing weird happenings that he couldn't explain. The feature length project in question was known as Marble Hornets, and the video series was published as an ARG on both YouTube and Twitter, using both platforms to document the filmer's experience with the Slenderman. Inspired by the Slenderman mythos, Marble Hornets began on the 20th of June 2009. One day after the Something Awful post. On an initial budget of just $500, the two original creators, Troy Wagner and Joseph Delarge, set out to create this web series, with realism being the intention. As opposed to having the episodes released on a schedule, both of them decided to post each of the episodes at random lengths and at random times. Marble Hornets was written, directed, and starring the two as the main characters, and followed Jay, a man who makes an attempt to find out what happened during the filming of Alex's film, Marble Hornets, that caused him to end the project abruptly after only two months of production. The web series used YouTube to its advantage, as the found footage nature of the channel led people to believe that the events of the series were real, with people drawing comparisons to Lonely Girl 15 for its realism and it being a more effective horror film series than what was available at the time. As of writing this video, there are 92 videos on the main channel, 87 of which are main entries to the series, and they are linked with videos on another channel known as To The Ark, a channel that uploaded cryptic videos that played a hand in the main story that was ongoing. To this date, Marble Hornets can be seen as the perfect adaptation of the Slenderman mythos in found footage form, effectively using YouTube to its advantage and genuinely having people guessing whether the events of the show were real or not. And then they made it into an actual film with a budget. We don't talk about that film. Marble Hornets also introduced the idea of proxies in the Slender universe. Proxies are humans that fall under the influence of the Slenderman. Other adaptations use this meaning, but during early MH, proxies were just seen as violently insane. I don't want to venture too much into spoiler territory as it's very entertaining and it's best that you probably go in blind, although it could be a potential topic for another video in the future. The early success of Marble Hornets led more adaptations to be created such as Everyman Hybrid and Tribe 12. The early foundations of Slenderman were now set and it had been rooted in internet folklore as a classic, but it was still missing something that would elevate its popularity and make sure that its legacy was here to stay. And that came around in 2012 with the release of After many videos and literary adaptations of The Slenderman, one thing that the legend was missing was a game adaptation. Well, we ended up getting that in 2012, when Parsec Productions decided to create what was known then as just Slender. In the game, you are shoved into a dark, scary forest armed with nothing but your flashlight, and you are given a simple objective. Find eight pages that are strewn everywhere around the forest, each of them ominous drawings that are mildly to do with the lore of The Slenderman. Seems simple enough? The only problem is, the forest is fucking massive! The entirety of Los Santos has absolutely nothing on how big the forest is in this game. While you're looking for the notes, you'll begin to notice that you're stalked by a malevolent being that seeks to do unspeakable things to you if it catches you during the game. This of course is the tall white man that is somehow in the forest with you. But why can't you just turn back and go home? The gate is right there! Just go home and have a wife! There was something about the original Slender game that seemed to click with people when it first came out in 2012. First things first, unlike many popular horror games that came out at that time period such as Resident Evil 6, this game was different. 
Instead of spawning in a forest packed with a car 98k and a pump shotgun and UI on the screen telling you who you're playing as in third person view as an objective and countdown flashes on your screen, the game decides to scrap all of that and go for a more minimalist approach. In the earliest version of the game, all you were greeted with was a title card. Then you're in the game with one objective, collect all eight pages. Simple enough, right? Wrong! Slendy was not going to let you win the game that easily. Who do you think of falling? As you continue collecting all of the notes, some ominous sounds start making themselves known. When the game started, all you were greeted with was... Silence. There wasn't any overwhelming gust of wind that would send you flying through the forest as the trees thrash about. All there was were your footsteps and the odd cricket. As you collected more notes, the music started working with layers. So the first layer was just a low booming sound. This progresses into a sound of a cat being thrown onto a piano several times, then the moans of the dam, then the sounds of several guns going off, then an aggressive growling noise, then some bongo drums and monkeys chanting in the distance, and then... Nothing. Until you get caught by Slender, and another cat is kicked onto a grand piano and slammed shut. The point is, with minimal resources, the game still managed to make itself seem creepy for people who are interested in those kind of scares. There were many different alternative modes to the game, such as the coveted $20 mode, where instead of the creepy crashes of the damned triggering when Slender catches you, he only wants you to give his lunch money back, as Gimme $20 by Ron Browns plays in the background. This was obviously removed in later versions due to the DMCA getting a bit angry. There was yet another mode that was made where it's just in daylight. I mean, you can make things in broad daylight scary if you put your mind to it. Uh, yeah, it just isn't scary. And there was yet another mod that was created for the game where you can just yeah. shoot Slenderman and the game's over, you're done. Now, originally when the game came out, if you are unlucky enough to have your flashlight run out or Slender just whips you around to take a good long hard look at him, your game crashes to the desktop. Of course, this isn't ideal, so in later versions upon getting captured by the Slender Man, you are given the option to start over again. This then evolved to the game actually having a menu screen this time, complete with loud background noises that would put CSGO to shame and destroy your speakers. Upon release of the game, it gained a lot of exposure and popularity because it was pretty much Babby's first horror game on YouTube, as per usual. People on YouTube loved recording their reactions and screaming their tits off upon sight of that tall, well-dressed figure. The official website for the game actually crashed because so many people wanted to try it out. But what the game was missing was a story. As far as everyone who played the game understood, you were in a never-ending loop of spawning in a forest with Slenderman constantly after you. Because of this, Parsec Productions went into hibernation to work on a new game in the Slenderman mythos. Slender The Arrival was released about a year later on March 26th, 2013, and is damn near the closest thing you get to a full-on Final Fantasy VII remake tier remaster of the original source material. It even had the remake of the first game, which was subsequently named The Eight Pages. Since this game was pretty much what the first game wanted to be but didn't have the budget to achieve it, the game had a lot of explaining to do as to WHY THE HELL YOU WERE IN THE FOREST IN THE MIDDLE OF THE NIGHT LOOKING FOR PAGES? Well, in The Arrival, you play as Lauren, who's friends with Kate, the main character in the previous game. And after the events of it, you are visiting Kate, who plans to sell her massive mansion in the great old forest of nowhere middle of. What's with horror characters and having Tories for parents? This house is massive! How can this only be for one person? Kate has to be selling this at 9k a month, minimum. Anyway, you visit her house and to your shock, there's drawings everywhere. Kate is literally a child though. How did she get up there to draw those markings? Did she get a ladder and draw them on? You continue investigating and you hear a scream in the woods. <laughs> And this becomes the basis for the entire game as you uncover the mystery behind everyone who seems to have disappeared at the hands of the Slenderman. The game is much more polished than the first in terms of its aesthetic, but there are many problems with it which admittedly had been fixed in later builds of the game. The game was too short, repetitive and frustrating. The problem with the game was that everything kind of boiled down to the same gameplay mechanic over and over and over and over and over again. Collect this, collect that, turn on this, turn on that. I'll give the game and its previous incarnation the benefit of the doubt as they were arguably the pioneers of this trend. But even then, it got a little bit tedious every time you loaded into a level and it tells you to go and flush 12 toilets or something. During the game, there's a point in which you travel into an underground mine, where you're tasked with turning on some generators in order to get out, and you're chased by a figure that really seems to hate it when you flash a light at it. In the game, it's referred to as the Chaser but this is a callback to what Marble Hornets called a proxy. Throughout the rest of the clues that the game provides, you eventually find out that Kate is now a proxy of the Slenderman. That sounds like a really scuffed metal album. 
or a cult? It turns out that Kate is a proxy after the events of the original 8 pages, with new lines stating that the Slenderman has plans for her. Now I'm not going to spoil the rest of the game as despite me lamenting its shortcomings, it's still a game that should be experienced once blind, so you can go and get it on Steam if you want, or just watch a playthrough if you're too scared to do that. With the release of these two games, Slender's popularity exploded on the internet. In 2011, Notch added a new hostile mob to the game, and when people noticed that it had some similarities to the Slenderman, he went and named it the Enderman. People were starving for some tall man content, to the point that several spin-offs were created from the Slenderman mythos, the most popular and well-known one being Slenderman Shadow. This game was basically Slender on steroids. Instead of one location where you're collecting 8 pages or notes or something along those lines, you are given 8 different maps. Different ways in which to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And more ways to collect the same notes over and over and over and over again. These games were released between August the 12th and October the 8th, 2012. And they were extremely popular due to the fact that they made for good YouTube content. Plop a flip camera in front of your screen and use your Android front camera to record yourself failing to collect two notes on Slender Mansion for easy YouTube revenue. All the games were the same kind of premise as the original. You just spawn in a random map and start collecting notes with the same noise progression as all the other games as you start collecting more notes. This specific gameplay type wasn't really new to the whole horror genre but it changed a lot as more game developers began to use the formula to generate scares such as Baldi's Basics and Education and Learning. A game that was created in a game jam competition and was one of those games that looked like it was a fun, poorly made and lighthearted educational game but it devolves into an extremely creepy premise, set in a school and having you as the player collect 7 notebooks, all while answering maths oh questions along the way. The popularity of that game led to other versions of the game being created such as Advanced Education with Viktor Strabovsky. That game would give anyone PTSD over their GCSE results as the questions require you to think a little bit more about them. And unlike Baldi's Basics, you don't have the luxury of the entire game being paused while you answer a question, which would lead to this happening. I'm just in. What? Slender's gameplay model had a very big effect in the horror industry, as the minimalist approach to the game, only giving you one goal with absolutely no help whatsoever, giving rise to more indie developers making games that use this mechanic in different and unique ways, such as, ironically enough, The Joy of Creation Reborn, which was pretty much a Slender copy where you collected items, but in that game you avoided animatronics, even the last level was set in a forest. Even though Slender was seen as highly influential in this field, a lot of events would take place, especially in 2014, that would damage the reputation of the Slenderman and lead it to become more irrelevant and looked down upon in the public eye. On May the 31st, 2014, two 12 year old girls in Wisconsin stabbed a fellow 12 year old classmate, Peyton Lutner, over 19 times. The reason? They wanted to appease the Slenderman. They claimed that they wanted to commit a murder as the first step to becoming proxies for the Slenderman, as they'd read about it online beforehand. First off, who was giving these girls access to these sites in the first place? And why were they in that corner of the internet? It should be well known that people in that corner of the internet aren't exactly the biggest moral arbiters of truth out there. <coughs> <coughs> Peyton ended up surviving the stabbing and returned to health in September of that year, but the effect that it had on the greater community was immense, with several documentaries and media outlets using the events to highlight the dangers of children using the internet, since these girls were of such a young age. The events of the stabbing irreversibly altered the legend of the Slenderman forever and the community that surrounded the mythos, as people, especially adults, began seeing Slenderman as something that could be psychologically damaging to children who read up on things surrounding him, and real life cases of people going crazy over this so called effect of the Slenderman. Most of the original websites and documents of the Slenderman also began to get less and less popular, with a lot of them simply shutting down because literally no one cared about him anymore. This was until Sony Pictures, the masterminds behind hits such as Into the Spider-Verse, Hotel Transylvania, Don't Breathe and The Emoji Movie announced the Slenderman movie. This movie would surely bring the public right back in favour of the Slenderman, an actual proper film adaptation that's released in cinemas and not directed DVD, and it's not a fan fiction tier film attached to Marble Hornet. Count me in, this is gonna be the film sucked. If all the events after the unfortunate stabbing weren't enough to kill it, the film certainly put the final nail in the coffin. Now I won't go over the film in detail as there's a really good video reviewing the film by Elvis the Alien which is available on this channel now, go watch it. But the film was a box office bomb. 
If you didn't know that the film even existed, then I don't blame you because it looks like no one did. The film also received reviews that would make the Emoji Movie shed a tear, as The Verge would later describe the film as being a nail in the coffin of a dying fandom. Which takes us to today, where Slender is treated as a meme nowadays. The scare factor of the Slender Man seems to have gone completely and it's now hard to take it seriously, with the theatrical film being released many years too late. Despite this, Slender's influence in the horror community can't be forgotten, as the effect that one simple Photoshop had years and years ago is one that can still be felt today, albeit a lot less intense than how it was at its peak. This is yet another video that a lot of people in the comments and on Twitter asked me about and I decided to finally cover the franchise and character that a lot of people seem to have forgotten nowadays. I'm not completely changing my channel to an entire horror related channel, don't worry. I'm just catching up on the spooktober content that I've apparently missed. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. If you want to support the channel more and allow me to make more regular content, why not pledge to my Patreon? Joining my Patreon can net you access to all of my scripts so you can see how I write my videos and even read some jokes that I don't keep in. You also get special files that I create just for my videos that I'm uploading in bulk. You also get verbal producer credit in my videos as well as the ability to watch them earlier than anyone else, and you get to talk to me regularly on my Discord server, all of which is linked in the description. I also stream a lot on Twitch and I'm gunning for partners, so if you can follow me there and tune into streams where I sometimes edit my videos, play games, mainly horror games, and maybe other stuff on the side, that would be great. I also post highlights of my streams as well as random memes onto my second channel, which is linked in the sidebar of my main channel, so if you want to subscribe there for some funny gaming content, by all means. Wow, this is a long outro. Okay, thanks to Angie, Red Dawn Boulder, Bailey, Admiral Vape, Francis, Dakota Lewis, Dag and Kilobytes for pledging to me with the highest ascended pledge, and I'll be sure to see you in another video.